So I'm going to be talking about food, ethics, and sustainability today. Some of the information I present might be new to you. It might be things you haven't heard or thought about before. It's going to be all evidence and fact-based. What I'm here to do today is to ask you, what are your values? What do you care about? Do you care about peace and justice and sustainability? What kind of world do you want to see? And are you doing your best to live your life in alignment with those values you say you support? So I just want to get you to think critically and ask yourself about your values, about your daily actions and choices, and whether you feel like you are living the way that's going to put us closer to the world you want to see rather than further away from it. Social injustice, violence, and oppression. We're going to talk about some science and sustainability in a minute first, but I just want to ask you this question. What is your definition of these words? Who do they apply to? Does it apply beyond human? Does it apply to non-human animals, to the planet? Can we have violence against nature? Additionally, is it still injustice and is it still violence if it's acceptable and normal in society? If it's part of our culture, is it still injustice? or oppression. Keep that in mind as we start going through the rest of this presentation. Let's talk about sustainability and environmentalism. Hot topic and something that I think most of us, and especially people that are in college today, you have your whole life ahead of you, right? Concerns about climate change, deforestation, pollution, the kind of earth and planet you're going to have to live on in the future is really important and something I know a lot of people are concerned about. So I've listed a number of issues related to the environment here that I think are some of the biggest environmental issues we're facing, from climate change to pollution to deforestation, resource depletion, being able to produce enough food to feed the people on this planet, being able to have a livable planet that's not too hot and that doesn't have too many natural disasters going forward in the future, food insecurity, environmental racism. So we'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute, but that's sort of the human impact and how discrimination and disparities that are already existing in our culture kind of impact people through these environmental problems. So the thing about all of these environmental problems is that there is one single industry that is doing more to cause and contribute to every single one of these problems I've listed than any other industry on the planet. It's our food and agriculture system. Specifically, animal agriculture. That's the raising and killing of animals for human consumption so that we can eat their flesh and secretions. And if hearing the term flesh and secretions makes you at all uncomfortable, why? Because that's the truth. When we eat meat, we are eating the literal flesh of another being. Milk and eggs are things that are secreted, right? The breast milk of a cow or part of the reproductive system of a chicken. They're secreted by animals. So that's the truth. We cover that up. We cover the reality up with euphemisms and words like bacon and beef and a McBurger. But the reality is a little bit different. And so animal agriculture is inherently an incredibly inefficient system. This chart shows the biomass, the, the literal weight and mass of living beings on this planet, going back to 10,000 years ago to what's projected to be the case by 2050. The blue is the domesticated animals, largely made up of cows, pigs, chickens, and turkeys, that we humans are raising for food. So notice the red is humans. The blue, the domesticated animals we're raising, far exceeds the number of humans on this planet. We have brought that into existence so that we can eat meat, milk, dairy, and eggs. And this is really important when we talk about sustainability. If we're concerned about feeding the world, if we're concerned about having enough land and fresh water and a climate to live in, right? We're doing something that is incredibly inefficient. We are cycling nutrients through animals before they get to us and before we eat them. So just a few facts, right? Domesticated land animals cover 45% of the land mass in the US. 
Almost half of our land in the United States is being taken up largely by animals that are grazing. More of that is taken up by the crops, the corn and soy that we grow to feed to animals. Freshwater consumption in the United States, 80 to 90 percent is used for agriculture. Worldwide, about 20 to 30 percent of all fresh water is used for farmed animals, for animal agriculture. 20 to 30 percent of our fresh water. So when we hear concerns about fresh water depletion, if we're not talking about animal agriculture and where so much of our water is going, we're ignoring a big problem. We're missing the point. A single pound of beef takes approximately 2,500 gallons of water to produce. A single pound of beef. Think about just how much water we're talking about there. That is an enormous amount. And it's way more than it would take to grow some plant-based proteins and foods. So it's really, really inefficient. And I want to show you another chart to illustrate this point. This is something called an energy pyramid or trophic levels. When I talk about veganism or plant-based diets to people, one of the most common things that come up, comes up is the idea that there's a food chain, right? You've all heard the idea of a food chain before, how you know, maybe humans are meant to eat meat or we're at the top of the food chain. So there's a food pyramid here. This is also called trophic levels, and it describes the flow of energy in our environment. All energy on this planet originates from the sun. That's the bottom here. The sun comes down and plants, which are considered autotrophs, they make their own food via photosynthesis. They take the sun's energy and they convert it into energy that sustains them. That's how all energy on this planet starts. And then we have heterotrophs, or animals that then can't make their own energy via photosynthesis and have to get it by eating food. So then we have animals that then eat plants. The first level would usually be herbivores. So they're considered primary consumers. They directly eat plants and then they convert the energy that's in plants into energy to fuel themselves and their bodies. But there's something really inefficient about this process. So what this is showing is if we say the energy starts at 100%. The sun's energy comes in, plants convert that via photosynthesis to energy. Primary consumers then consume those plants. When they do so, 90% of the energy that originally was in those plants that came from the sun is lost as heat or energy when the organisms breathe, live, survive. Only 10% of it actually gets stored in their bodies that can then be carried on to the next level. Right? So if an herbivore then is eaten by a carnivore or an omnivore at the next level, additionally, another 90% of the energy that was stored in those herbivores' bodies is lost in that transfer. So every step we go up, it gets incredibly inefficient. We can talk about the food chain right, and talk about what's natural, but there's a reason that in the food chain, carnivores are way, way fewer on this planet. There are way more herbivores, there are way more plants, because it takes so much more energy to sustain a carnivore in this biological system than it does an herbivore because of this energy transfer. So here's the thing. We, as conscious human beings that aren't really living a natural right life now, right? Like nothing about the way we live our lives, going to the supermarkets, living in air-conditioned apartments, or dorms, shopping at a grocery store and buying meat, dairy, and eggs pla packaged in plastic wrap, you know, shipped in from who knows where, and animals raised in large industrial farms. Nothing about that is natural or part of this food chain. And we have agency and free will as humans to choose where we want to enter this food pyramid at, right? We have a choice. Are we gonna try and act like carnivores? which this planet can't sustain very many of, and we have seven billion people on the planet that we want to sustain? Or can we enter this food pyramid lower down and be a primary consumer, consuming plants? This is a choice that we have. And that's something to think about when we're talking about the efficiency of a system, the environment, and how many people we want to be able to feed and support. I'm going to illustrate this point another way. Imagine a single cow. If we have an acre of land, and we're thinking about trying to produce food for ourselves on this acre of land, if we take a single cow and graze it on that land, it will take several years for that cow to consume enough food, grass off of that land, to grow big enough to be slaughtered 
so that we can eat their flesh. And during that time, that cow has to drink water, lots and lots of water over a two-year period. They are pooping a lot, producing lots of manure over that two-year period. They are eating, right? They're using energy. There's inputs it takes to raise that cow. And it takes, you know, a year or two or a few months, depending. But there's a lot of time and energy and inputs that go into an animal. And then they'd be slaughtered, and not even all of their body do we consume, right? So then we get a little bit of meat out of it. Versus if we took that land and that water that all went into one single cow over a two-year period and used that instead to grow vegetables, beans, grains, right? It can produce so many more calories and so much more protein on that same amount of land with those same amount of resources to be able to feed more people. So there's just this inherent inefficiency with cycling nutrients and resources through animals before we consume them. Here is another way of looking at this. This is from a study in 2018 published in the journal Science, and it's looking at the different types of milk. So you can see from greenhouse gas emissions to land use and water, dairy milk, cow's milk, stands out as being the worst in all three categories. Almond milk maybe uses a little more water. Rice milk maybe uses a little more water and produces more emissions, but none of them compare to cow's milk. And this, the study that this came from actually showed it was one of the largest analyses looking at over 37,000 different types of farms around the world, from animal-based farms to plant-based farms to small-scale to backyard to humane and free-range farms to industrial large farms. And they found that even the most intensive plant-based agriculture used fewer resources and produced fewer emissions and had a lighter environmental footprint than the very best, most efficient, most sustainable animal-based farm. That's the takeaway from the most comprehensive study on different types of farms that has been conducted. Pollution, this is the other side of it, right? So we have the, the inputs, the resource consumption it takes to produce animal-based foods, and then we have the outputs, right? What this is causing. And this is an incredible problem. And this is where a lot of the environmental racism comes in. And North Carolina is a great example of this. It has one of the highest concentrations in the country of pig farms. Has anybody ever smelled a pig farm personally? It's horrible, right? Smells absolutely horrible. This image on the right is a pig farm. All of those sheds are filled with probably 10,000 or more, you know, pigs all crammed together. And the pink are lagoons with the manure and waste produced by pigs. It doesn't get wastewater treatment the way human waste does. We don't have a system for it. It sits in these lagoons, and then, because we need something to do with it, it often gets sprayed out onto fields, and you can smell it. It's, it's suffocating and horrible. It gets sprayed out onto other fields because they're desperate for something to do with it. It runs off into our water, our streams, our rivers. It pollutes drinking water. And where this becomes a problem for people, nobody wants these farms in their backyard. But rich communities seem to do a much better job keeping these farms from being built in their areas. Right? The large industrial farms that cause a lot of this pollution are most often located in lower income and black and brown communities where people often don't have as much of a choice or aren't able to fight these farms you know, off the way you know, richer, higher income areas do. And it creates these huge health disparities where people are suffering from diseases and lung problems and breathing problems and asthma from the pollution and smells that these farms create. There's a new film just coming out called The Smell of Money that is all about the human impact of the waste from these farms. I highly recommend it. Again, we have this inefficiency problem. So a single dairy farm with just about 2,000 cows produces as much waste approximately as a city with over 400,000 people. They're much bigger, they eat much more than us, and we don't have a system for dealing with their waste. What do we do with it? The ammonia that's running off from the fertilizer and you know, things that are used to produce food to feed animals on lots of these farms have created over 500 dead zones in our oceans. Dead zones where literally no life, no fish, no organisms, no oxygen exists. They are completely dead. And the Gulf of Mexico has one. And a lot of it is runoff from these types of farms. 
pollution is a huge, huge issue with animal agriculture. Climate change. That's the other thing that this is a huge cause of. Cows produce a lot of methane emissions, so they're one of the biggest causes of greenhouse gas emissions. But there's more, right? Animal agriculture requires a lot of land to both graze animals and to grow the grain to feed animals. The Amazon rainforest is being deforested, and 91% of the deforestation is due to animal agriculture, a combination of they're literally cutting down the Amazon rainforest to graze cattle, and they're also cutting it down to grow corn and soy crops. But the interesting thing about corn and soy, it's not going to feed people. Whether it's in Brazil or the United States, it's all being grown largely to feed to cows, pigs, chickens, and turkeys so that they can be sort of fattened up more quickly and more efficiently so that we can eat more meat. When we cut down trees, we lose carbon sequestration. We lose the ability of trees to prevent climate change. So that's causing a lot of the climate change. So this is a, a recent position paper analyzing the UN's numbers, and they wrote this up and published it. And it basically suggests not only is animal agriculture one of the leading causes of climate change, that it may be the leading cause of climate change responsible for as much as 87% of climate emissions. And yet, what do we talk about instead of that? Right? When we think about emissions and food or climate change, what's one of the biggest things that comes up? Plastic, cars, eating local, right? Everybody heard of that one? Right? We want to reduce our food emissions, let's eat local, which is a great idea. And I am a huge fan of eating local. But there's a little bit more to the story. This pie chart is from a study analyzing the food supply chain and the different causes of emissions. Everyone talks about the importance of eating local if we want to reduce our food emissions. But what this shows is that transportation of the food, both in the processing of it and then to the final distribution of it, is together about 11% of the emissions associated with a food. It's a fraction of where most of the emissions come from. Production is about 83%. What does production mean? That means the type of food. Beef doesn't matter if it's produced in your backyard and it didn't have to be shipped anywhere. Beef is so carbon intensive and produces so many emissions compared to growing potatoes or carrots or lentils that there is a much lower carbon footprint associated with lentils shipped in from across the country than beef grown in your backyard. That's what this shows, right? But everybody talks about eating local and we're ignoring, again, the industry that's actually inefficient and causing this harm. So let's talk about healthcare for a minute, okay? Because when we start talking about plant-based diets or veganism, people have a lot of questions about protein and health and is it healthy? So let's look at this first question. What are the biggest causes of death and disability in the United States? Heart disease, number one killer in the United States. Diabetes is a pretty big second. Cancer, pretty big third. What can diet do? Can diet affect any of these? Yeah, heart disease, diabetes especially, very diet related. And they're very associated with overconsumption of cholesterol, saturated fat, and animal products, meat, dairy, eggs. So isn't it interesting that when we start talking about diet and food, the first question that you usually hear people ask is, can you be healthy as a vegan? What about protein? When the reality is that the current standard American diet is largely what is killing a majority of Americans, or at least contributes to it. So why are we not asking what's going wrong with that diet? Where do people get their fiber, which only comes from plants? We're not asking those questions. So I think that framing, when we bring up these questions, is really important so that we reframe it and think about what is actually causing harm, health-wise, nutrition-wise, so where can we focus our attention and ask the right questions? This is a map showing the blue zones. The blue zones are five regions of the world that have the highest populations of centenarians, people that are living to 100 or longer. And because these are kind of some unique clusters of people, many of them still eating traditional indigenous foods that they've been eating for generations, a lot of researchers have focused in on this and said, what do these groups of people do that, that's different than what everyone else is doing? What do they have in common? And when they looked at these, when it came to diet, and there were some other aspects in terms of fitness and community and other things that affect health and longevity, but in terms of diet, what they all had in common 
was that they all ate predominantly plant-based diets. Not 100%, but mostly plants and pretty minimal animal protein. So again, that question of, you know, can vegans be healthy? Let's take a step back and ask, what are the healthiest people eating and what are the people who have a lot of health issues eating? What does the data say? Is another research project, it's one of the longest running epidemiological studies of nutrition that's analyzed a lot of different regions and diets, particularly focused in China. And what they found is that the higher the level of any animal protein in the diet, the higher the rates of inflammation and chronic disease. Animal protein may not be the wonderful, magical thing that we all seem to think it is, because the data shows something a little bit different. A single egg has a lot of cholesterol in it. So these are just a few bullet points from some research. A eating eggs increases your risk of heart disease and diabetes. Animal protein has also been linked with increasing the growth of cancer. So this is the reality of what nutritional data actually says. If you are still concerned about getting enough protein by eating plants, these are three plant-based athletes. U.S. soccer player who was part of the winning team. She's largely plant-based. Serena and Venus Williams both eat predominantly plant-based diets. Best tennis player in the world, right? Torrey Washington. He is a vegan bodybuilder who has actually been vegetarian from birth, so has never eaten any meat in his life and has been now vegan for 20 some years. If all of these, and there's many, many others out there, right? If award-winning, top-notch athletes can survive and thrive and win competitions and be the best in the world on a plant-based diet, doesn't that mean the rest of us probably can too? So that brings me to this question. If we can live happy and healthy lives without hurting or killing others, why not do so? That's the question I really want you to walk away thinking about. I think most of us already agree that it's wrong to hurt animals unnecessarily. This is a value that I think most Americans especially already hold. If you were walking down the street and you saw someone on the street beating a dog and laughing about it and you asked like, why are you doing that? And they said, because I get enjoyment and pleasure from watching the dog squeal in pain. What would you think? We'd be disgusted, right? We'd be horrified, we'd wanna stop it we'd say that is not a good reason to cause harm to an animal. Pleasure, entertainment, not good reasons to harm an animal. But it's so interesting that most of us already feel this way about cats and dogs and even some other animals, pigs or goats, that sometimes you know videos go viral on TikTok or Instagram of a goat who had a bad leg and someone bandaged them up or gave them a little cart or a wheelchair. People love videos of those single animals with these heart-wrenching stories. We want to cheer for them, right? We want them to survive and be happy. And then we ignore the reality of our food system and the fact that we kill more than 10 billion land animals every single year in the United States. That's more than the entire human population on the planet right now. And we kill that many land animals. That's ignoring fishes, and sea life every single year. So I wanna come back to these words I asked you about before, social injustice, violence, and oppression. Do they apply to animals? Can we be violent towards animals? Is it an injustice to unnecessarily harm and kill animals if we don't have to? And is pleasure a good justification or not? Because most people eat meat, dairy, and eggs because they like the taste. So how is that morally any different, right? We enjoy the taste pleasure. How is that morally any different than the person on the street that gets pleasure from seeing a dog squeal in pain? It's a different kind of pleasure, right? We enjoy the taste. We're not saying we like animal abuse, but that's what we are supporting and paying for with our choices in this system. So it's a system of normalized violence. And that's why I asked before, is it still violence? Is it still oppression? Is it still social injustice if it's normal? If it's deemed culturally acceptable or a tradition? Can you think of any other injustices in the past that were deemed a tradition or part of our culture or necessary? Slavery. Sexism, right, is a really good example. Sexism is one of my favorite to talk about. This is a flyer 
from the early 1900s, right before women got the right to vote. And there was a whole group of people that were literally distributing flyers, arguing against women's suffrage, saying families are going to fall apart, rates of violence are going to increase, a woman's place is in the home. This is unnatural, this is, you know, we're breaking tradition, society's going to fall apart, our economy is going to work differently. All these arguments were made about women, but most of us can see today that those are not good reasons to continue to deprive women of rights or oppress them. And now I want to be clear. Every oppression is unique. They are all different. Everyone has their own circumstances and unique facets about them. But the parallels I'm drawing are these systems of oppression, because there are a lot of similarities between systems of oppression, and there are a lot of similarities about the attitudes of the oppressors and the justifications that we have used throughout history to justify oppressing others. It's normal, it's natural, and it's necessary are some of the three biggest justifications that have been used for nearly every other injustice throughout time. And we use those to justify what we do to animals in the food system today. So this is why I say we live in a system of normalized violence. Most of us don't recognize, and it's out of sight and out of mind, what we do to animals. But it is absolutely violence, it is absolutely injustice, and oppression. And I want to explain a little bit more why. Because a lot of times we don't think about this, right? We are so disconnected when we go to the store and buy a carton of milk or a plastic wrapped package of meat or a burger at a fast food restaurant. We don't think, and we don't have to think because it's, you know, out of sight, out of mind. We're not directly seeing the reality of how it got there, how it was created. So it's easy to ignore it. But just because it's normal, doesn't mean it's not oppression. What we do to animals is absolutely oppression and exploitation, if you think about it, at this root level. We breed animals into existence. We control their every waking minute and lives. We confine them. We mutilate them routinely. Animals on farms get their beaks cut off, their toes cut off, their testicles removed, their ears docked or cut off, all without anesthesia or any kind of pain medication. And this is legal and standard practice across farms in the United States. And we do that, and then we confine them in tiny cages or sheds with thousands of other animals, where they're standing in their feces and the smell of these farms and ammonia and their own waste. Then we separate them from their family members. We decide when they're going to get to see their babies, when they're last going to get to see their friends, when they get separated, transported, fed, watered. And then at the end of us brutalizing them and using their bodies, then we decide, today is the day you're going to die. They have no say in it. They can't escape. They can't run away. We control all of that. So even when it's done in a better way, on a small backyard, free range, or you know, organic farm, all of those animals still end up in the same slaughterhouse and they still have to deal with a human at the end of the day saying, today is the day your life is over. Today is the day you're going to become a piece of meat, dismembered, have your throat slit so that you can end up on someone's plate. Is that freedom? If it's not freedom, right, what is it? Oppression, violence, injustice, especially if it's unnecessary. And that's the question I come back to, right? If we have a choice, and one choice causes this harm and violence, and one choice doesn't, what justification do we have to harm and take the life of another being for unnecessary, trivial reasons? So it's a system of normalized violence. So I want to tell you a little bit more about the dairy industry in particular, because this is one that people don't often know the details of. So in the dairy industry, it's, in my opinion, one of the cruelest and worst parts of the animal agriculture industry because it isn't just animals that are raised and confined for meat and have their lives prematurely ended. But there's also reproductive and sexual exploitation involved. So dairy cows are mammals like humans and they only produce milk when they have babies, right? And it, they don't produce milk forever after having a baby. So after a little bit of time, their milk supply wanes and then they have to get pregnant again to produce enough milk for it to be profitable for a farmer. 
So we forcibly impregnate dairy cows, right? And I mean that, you can look it up, right? Forcibly impregnate them, constantly keep them pregnant, and then when they have their baby, within just hours usually, we take their baby from them, separate them, and these are feeling, intelligent beings that love their babies just like we do, that have personalities and lives and interests and wants just like we do. And they bellow and cry out for their babies when separated. Again, I encourage you, if you're interested, look this up. There's a video called Dairy is Scary on YouTube that has footage of this. It's a horrible process where the mothers and babies are separated. The babies, if male, can't produce milk, and so they get sent to become veal. Female dairy cows are raised up, given a formula or replacement food rather than their mother's milk, and then they too, when they're old enough, get sent to basically be milking machines as well. And then after the mother gives birth, she's going to spend multiple hours a day standing on end, hooked up to machines, milking her. Her udders sometimes get painful, and they get infected, right? There's all kinds of things that go on with this. And then after years and years of this repeat cycle, repeatedly having her babies taken from her, then she is sent to the slaughterhouse and has her throat slit as well. That's the dairy industry. We don't think about it a lot. There is a lot of cruelty in that, a lot of violence, all because humans want to drink the breast milk of another species. This is an image that I took in Iowa, and I wanted to bring this up briefly. There's a lot of victims that never even make it to the food supply. Victims whose bodies are essentially wasted. And this is due to infectious disease. So these are pigs that I took a picture of at a factory farm in Iowa. They were in a dumpster right by the public road, so I was able to drive by and see them. These are baby piglets probably days or weeks old, on a farm where swine flu probably infected a few pigs. And when a single pig on a farm gets swine flu or a single bird on a chicken farm gets bird flu, farmers don't want it to spread and they will mass kill the entire shed or the entire farm or however far it's spread. And those animals are not considered edible and their bodies are literally dumped in the trash. This is the egg industry. I think that's another important one to talk about briefly. And I know this is probably very hard to hear. It's hard to think about. But this, again, is the reality behind what's going on in the supermarket, what's going on in restaurants that we don't think about. Eggs often seem very innocuous to a lot of people, right? They're, you know, a few backyard chickens, supposedly, or eggs just, or chickens just naturally lay eggs. So what's wrong if we take them, right? Well, one, that question of do we need to is it ours to take, right? And then three, what is the reality of how this actually works today in our current system? The reality is that all egg-laying hens, backyard, free range, or factory farmed, are bought and shipped usually from chicken hatcheries. And in chicken hatcheries, where they're trying to produce a bunch of egg-laying hens, males are considered useless, so they get sex. So you have all these chickens that hatch on a day, and then someone goes through them really quickly, looks at them to see if they're male or female, and tosses them in a different bucket, kind of like an inanimate object. Male chicks can't produce eggs, and they're a different breed than the chickens that usually get raised for meat. So it's, they don't grow big enough fast enough to be a meat chicken usually. So it is more economical for the industry to literally grind them up alive on their first day of life. So half of all chicks in the egg industry, all males, get put on a conveyor belt, and that's what you see here is a still shot of a video where chickens are on a conveyor belt, and that's a, a grinder. They literally get ground up alive, tossed in the trash, or used as fertilizer or packing material. That's the egg industry. Normalized violence. If this is what's going on, and this is the reality of the system, I know a question that often comes up is, why haven't I heard this before? Or why haven't we thought about this before? Why isn't this information more common? This is why. It's a system of normalized violence that is intentionally perpetuated by million dollar industries that stand to make a profit from exploiting people, animals, and the planet. Money, profit, and they do it with advertising campaigns, very 
stealthily planned ones, got milk campaigns that have gone back 50, 60 years that try to convince us, and, and essentially it's propaganda and they lie to us by saying milk is necessary, right? They try to create this idea that milk is necessary for strong bones, that animal protein is necessary to be an athlete or to live a happy and healthy life. When the science and evidence shows that none of that is true. And we have advertising campaigns and billboards all around us, 24-7, TV, on social media, when we drive down the highway, that are all reinforcing the idea that it's necessary to eat animals, that it's okay to eat animals, and they show images of happy things unrelated to the reality of what's really happening to animals in this system. And it's convincing. And it creates this normalization bias where none of us are aware of the, the environment and the society we live in. None of us are aware of the violence because we're seeing the information from a very successful propaganda campaign that's driven by corporate profits. When we think about how do we change this, this is where I think individuals become really powerful. Speciesism is a form of discrimination to refer to animals similar to the terms racism and sexism. Speciesism is the idea that we are treating animals differently or viewing them differently based on the arbitrary criteria of species. Animals can feel pain and suffer, they're aware, they're sentient. All of the reasons that we believe humans should be protected from violence and oppression, animals have those traits too. But solely based on their species and the fact that they're not human, we say it's okay to do what we do to them. It's okay to brutalize them, violate them, torture them, and slaughter them. And all of the billboards and all the propaganda I showed you reinforce that speciesism and maintain it in society. And this is where our fork becomes a really powerful tool. We as individuals have a choice three times a day about what kind of future we want to see what our values are and what we want to stand for. And that's why I come back to the question, right, of what are your values? What kind of world do you want to see? Because that's what this is really all about. I cannot force anyone to do anything. I can only share information. What you do with that information is up to you. But that's why I ask, what kind of world do you want to see? Do you care about animal abuse? Do you care about violence and injustice? Do you want to see a more sustainable, compassionate, peaceful world? And are you making choices that are in alignment with that? Do you make choices on a day-to-day -day basis that bring us further towards the world you'd like to see rather than away from it? And personal choice is incredibly powerful. One, we live in a system of supply and demand. We get to vote with our dollar. And this is really true and very evidenced by the explosion in non-dairy milks. A few years ago, you couldn't go to a Starbucks or a grocery store and see oat milk and soy milk and almond milk and have all these different options. That's because consumers have been voting with their dollar and saying, we don't want to drink cow's breast milk anymore. We want an alternative, right? or we're lactose intolerant, this isn't even good for me, I need something else. That's the power of consumer demand, and the dairy industry is failing more and more every year. The only reason they're still in existence are because these industries have gone to the government and lobbied the government to bail them out. So now our government uses our tax dollars to prop up a failing industry that based on consumer demand would be dying very rapidly. Supply and demand, our choices, they matter, but they matter more than that because each one of us is a walking billboard and an example of the kind of world we want to see, of the values that we want to stand for. When we sit down in front of other people and say, I'm going to eat plants, I'm going to reject this system of normalized violence, even though it's, you know, most people deem it normal, natural, and necessary, I'm going to do something different. And even if you do nothing else but make that choice for yourself, you start to influence the people around you. You show people, this is what I stand for. These are the values I care about. This is the way I'm gonna live my life. And you become an example that other people can look at. And it creates a ripple effect where when people start to live their lives in alignment with the things they care about and make choices that further support sustainability and justice and nonviolence, people around them see that and ask questions and it spreads. 
And social change research suggests that we actually don't even need a majority of the population to believe something at all to create change. That we actually only need about 10 to 25% of the population to strongly hold an idea or belief about something before it quickly creates this ripple effect that can transform society almost instantaneously when the trajectory might have looked different. People can't really predict it. It's this, this kind of tipping point that can happen almost overnight when a certain percentage is reached. So let's think about that when we're thinking about the choices we make and the kind of world we want to live in. Just want to share, if you want more information, I'm on social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. I make videos and content on these topics as well. And if you scan this, I have a free downloadable vegan living guide that you can sign up and it will be emailed to you if you scan this. And that is my social media information. And again, I'm gonna leave you with the question, if we have a choice, and those of us that do, if we can live happy and healthy lives without causing harm to others, why not do so? Thank you. Great question. So the question is, right, how do we help spread the information, especially to older people maybe, who are suffering from chronic illness or diet-related diseases? And one of the best things I've noticed is people become more open once they're facing a life-changing illness themselves, right? We wish we could get to them before that, but people have habits and traditions, right? It can be very hard, but what I've found is when people suddenly get that diagnosis, that diabetes, or they're going to have to go on insulin or you know, drugs, that then they can start questioning things and saying, is there an alternative? Can I do something else different, right? Is this, is this the only thing out there? And there's a lot of really great documentaries like What the Health, Game Changers, Forks Over Knives, that really focus on the health and nutrition aspect. And, um, and it can be very powerful. There's books and information. And, um, and setting that example, too. That's actually one of the most powerful things I've seen, right? When one person in a family or a community, you know, and I know people personally like this, someone who had colon cancer and changed her diet, didn't ever get surgery or chemo, reversed her colon cancer, which is a very diet-related cancer. And it, people in her community were like, whoa, what did you do? I didn't know this was possible. I know someone who has colon cancer. Do you think this might work for them, right? And, and that can create that ripple effect too. But those personal examples of people whose lives have been changed by a healthier diet, I think are the most powerful. Oh, have you talked to any farmers about this? That's the, that's the question. Um, I have, and it's not something I do a lot of. I'm more focused on educating you know, individuals and consumers, but there's actually some programs called farm transition programs where former ranchers who kind of decided they didn't like what they were involved in and became a sanctuary or changed what they were doing are now helping other farmers transition, for example, their chicken farm to a mushroom producing farm. There's a lot of really interesting stories because the thing is a lot of farmers, they don't want to be involved in this, right? It's not a fun job to work at one of those pig farms that smells like that. Nobody really wants to do that. And oftentimes they're contract farms, right? Where a big corporation owns the farm and then employs people on the ground to kind of run them. And many times people running or working on these farms would do any other job if they could. So when people are provided an opportunity to transition and grow vegetables or do something different, many farmers are actually very open and would love to be able to feed people and grow a different type of food. What if it's hard for you to go vegan if you're really picky? Good question. So there's a lot of practical tips out there, and I actually have some resources over here for those that want it. I have several free vegan cookbooks. You know, it does take a little bit of retraining your taste buds sometimes, trying new foods, you know, testing out new things. There's some research that suggests it takes about three weeks to retrain or you know, adjust to new foods. So if you, you know, keep trying something you know, or you cut out certain foods, you might realize that you actually like a lot of new foods or your taste buds adjust over time. And there's a lot of always getting better plant-based alternatives, which I think are a really good transition food, right? So if you really like chicken nuggets, there's some pretty good plant-based chicken nuggets or these alternative meat and dairy products that taste pretty similar in many cases, and so make that transition easier as you start to expand your taste buds. 
Absolutely. Yes, the question is, right, do I talk to doctors or the medical system much because they don't get a lot of nutrition training. You're absolutely right. Doctors get very minimal nutrition training. We think they're experts in this and they actually are taught very little about food and how food can affect us. Um, I personally don't do as much of that, but I know many vegan and plant-based doctors who that is their whole mission and their program. They're outreaching to med schools. They're trying to create plant-based nutrition programs. So there's a lot of people doing that work. Um, personally, I'll talk to doctors one-on-one, -on -one, but I don't go directly to med schools for the most part. In the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, you can, they can be board certified. And then also PCRM yeah. works with hospitals, physicians There's committee. There's a lot of organizations, a lot of doctors that are absolutely doing that work. And it's changing, right? You start to see it behind the scenes, a lot more doctors that know about plant-based nutrition that are starting to recommend food instead of drugs and, and teach people these alternatives. I mean, the people that work in slaughterhouses, again, not a fun job, and often they're undocumented immigrants who don't have much of a choice in where they work, and these farms exploit them too, and it correlates to violence among human communities. Violence towards animals, research shows, is a huge predictor of violence towards people, domestic abuse and spousal abuse, these kinds of things. And people that have to work in these facilities are being desensitized. Like, these are some of the most brutal, horrible jobs if you're spending your day slitting an animal's throat. Psychologically, that is not pleasant. That can't be good for you. And you have to sort of become desensitized to what's going on. And then how does that desensitization carry over to other parts of your life? Nobody wants these jobs. These, these are not, these industries, it's time for them to transition. And this is something else that I think it's important to touch on that sometimes people bring up is like, what about the farmers? What about the economy, right? And that's where I go back to that question of, is the economy, is the way things are now, a good justification for violence and injustice? And two, the farmers and many of the people working these farms, they don't want to work in them either, right? It's not a good industry. The industry as a whole is brutal and horrific and violent, and it's time to transition. And it doesn't mean, you know, like just putting people out of work. It means transitioning to plant-based farms. It means finding new industries. It means finding better ways to support the economy and produce food and keep people, you know, having jobs that aren't these horrible, abusive, violent, you know, uh, industries. Yeah, great question. So two questions, right? One, what about sea life, fish farming? And two, what about like pesticides and industrial plant farming? Both very good. So I didn't touch on sea life, but they're actually some of the biggest forgotten victims. We kill not billions, but trillions of fish every single year from both wild caught, right? We take these giant nets that are like huge, huge acres in size and scrape the bottom of the ocean floor, picking up everything that's there, including dolphins, sharks, turtles, coral, right? Scraping it and then everything else just kind of dies and gets thrown out except for the fish we want. And then we also have fish farming, which is pretty much a factory farm in the ocean. And many of the fish that get caught are fed back to other fish in the farmed fish, right? It's, all, it's a horrible industry there too. And fish are some of the forgotten victims in terms of pain. We often think, oh, they're not mammals. They don't feel pain. They don't suffer the same way. And the science on that is actually very much the opposite. And they suffer excruciating amounts of pain with what we do. They have memory. They have connections. They have relationships with each other. And we're absolutely breaking those when we fish and farm them as well. And it's incredibly unsustainable, whether we're depleting the oceans or whether we're depleting the oceans to feed the farmed fish or growing grain and things like that to feed farmed fish, right? Like, again, it's still that inefficiency problem. In terms of your question about, you know, plant farming and pesticides and GMOs, I think the thing that's really important to keep in mind is that most GMO corn and soy crops right now are all being grown to feed farmed animals. Most of it is not going to be food for people. So if we switch to plant farming, even if it was still industrial plant agriculture, which I'm not a fan of, but even if it was, it would still free up so much land, use so much less water, be so much less GMO crops because most of it's being grown excessively to feed animals. But I absolutely agree with you. We need a better system. And that's, there's something called veganic agriculture, which is kind of the best of both worlds. It's vegan doesn't use animals, doesn't use manure. It's ethically, you know, vegan in that way. 
and it's organic and uses sustainable regenerative practices. And some people are having great success with this, growing healthy, amazing vegetables and food. Um, it hasn't super been scaled up yet, but there's a lot of potential there. And that's what I advocate for, right? I don't, we don't want more, nobody wants more corporate control of our food supply. We don't want more corporations spraying pesticides and doing all of that. And just switching to plant-based would significantly reduce the GMO and pesticide use. And then advocating for local, sustainable, veganic plant farming would do even more of that. Repeating the question, uh, does being vegan save you money? This kind of goes both ways. Some people think it's cheaper, some people think it's more expensive. And it really depends what you're eating, right? So if you go and you're gonna buy the vegan meats and cheeses 100% of the time and that's like all you're gonna eat, right now some of those products are a little bit more expensive than meat and dairy, but only because of what I mentioned before where our government subsidizes uses our tax dollars to artificially make the cost of a burger or milk much, much cheaper, right? A Big Mac that costs $4, if we actually accounted for the real price of it that wasn't subsidized by our government and tax dollars, it would be, you know, like $11, way more expensive. So plant foods naturally, because they're less resource intensive, you know, take a lot less inputs to produce, naturally are going to be cheaper than meat and dairy. They're only not because of our rigged system. But even so, plant foods like beans, rice, grains, veggies are cheaper. So a lot of people absolutely do save money if you're eating whole foods, if you start doing a lot more of your own cooking rather than eating out, and you're not solely depending on a bunch of the processed plant-based alternatives, which are a great transition food, right? But they're also not the healthiest. The healthiest foods are your whole plant foods, your home cooked vegetables and whole grains and things like that. And when people eat that way, it saves a lot of money. Yes, the question is right, the amount of things, right? Americans eat a lot of food, would it help if we eat less? Absolutely, I mean everything helps, right? Any changes that we make that reduce our footprint absolutely make a difference. I think ethics is where we get the question, right, of eating any at all. And it's that question of if we have a choice and one choice causes harm and violence. And so eating less is still good, but less is still some violence, some death that we're contributing to, right? So I, I don't advocate per se for eating less meat, but any steps that anybody takes in that direction, because I know that switching your diet and lifestyle can take some time and transition, I think any positive change is something that's good but I advocate for not eating and harming animals at all. I think a really good way of going about making the transition is start by picking breakfast. Pick a single meal and say like, I'm gonna focus on veganizing my breakfast every day. Maybe that's a meal that you already don't eat a lot for or you make it at home so you're not out with friends or in situations where you have to go to a grocery store or restaurant, right? So start by trying to veganize that meal. Then maybe after a couple weeks say like, okay, let me see if I can tackle lunch or dinner, or whatever's easiest for you, right? That's a really good way, I think, of, of starting to make that transition.